Thank you, Mehdi, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's fantastic to see the progress of API Days. I think I spoke in London in 2016, in fact, no, 2015. It was fantastic to see how the community has grown. Um, and I got a bit worried when, when Mehdi asked to check the audience in terms of how many from a business background and a tech background, because recently I started talking about brand strategy to a room that had a lot of engineers in it, and I could see panic looking at the door um, what could this possibly be uh, have got to do with APIs, okay, and the engineering and management of APIs. But I spent the last several years working extensively globally uh, with mature financial institutions as well as fintechs that are looking at the API economy. And just to echo what Simon was saying, <coughs> the transition and the scaling of this wonderful opportunity to improve services and grow the economy uh, is 20% coding, 80% people. Okay, so make no apology for starting to talk about uh, some of those softer issues. And, uh, and I suppose as a keynote, maybe just before we you know, spend two days getting into the detail with great people and great technology, uh, maybe look at the big picture uh, from a keynote perspective. So the big picture, as I've tried to describe it, is that APIs are powering the age of assistance. Okay, so before we start talking about banking or insurance or financial services, let's step back and ask ourselves, what looks like it's happening to all services. How are all services being designed and developed and how are they being consumed and how are they being prepared? Okay, so there's something much bigger going on than just open banking. Okay, so open banking has made some progress in terms of introducing the correct technologies uh, into mature financial services organizations, but certainly there's a distance to travel in terms of the sociology or the cultural factors. So let's step back and have a think about the, the age of assistance, okay? So perhaps we'll describe it in a couple of ways. First of all, in the context of partnering, that consumers, whether they're enterprises or, or consumers, um, expect their favorite brands to work together to offer them connected experiences. There's a whole new generation of young buyers who expect their favorite brands to collaborate and provide them with joined up journeys across those brands and across their products and services. And the question that I put out to, to more mature organizations is that if your marketing approach is based on interrupting this flow, you're taking a bigger and bigger risk as time goes on, okay? These buyers are expecting the services to come to them and they're expecting their brands to work together to provide a connected experience. So for many years, people have talked about customer journeys and in a very narrow context, it was often used where a, a buyer or a customer knocks on the, the door of my organization and the customer journey management is trying to make sure that they get into the right experience with my products and services, talk to the right people, and that's customer journey management. So an inward process after they've been attracted to, in the context of where we are now, my proprietary brand of digital assets. And then we manage the journey from that point onwards inside our organization. And Arguably, we're now work, it, it emerging into a world where customers are on a connected journey to an ecosystem. They're out there and brands increasingly have to expose their services into these connected journeys shared between multiple brands. So we're going from an inward thinking process about customer journeys into outward and increasingly as this becomes ingrained customer behavior, if you can't get your services out into those connected journeys, and if you can't communicate your brand meaning uh, into those environments, you're running a bigger and bigger risk. So I'm gonna come on and talk a bit more about some people who haven't thought about this deeply enough, think that these connected ecosystem journeys are making their brands disappear. Well, they're not. Um, but in fact, if you can't get connected into these multi-brand journeys, there's a real risk that your market position could disappear. Okay, so the age of assistance, think about it from a couple of perspectives. The new buying behavior and uh, ingrained behavior of younger buyers and younger businesses, and what is a customer journey now? It's not something that's internally focused. So sometimes we work with clients and work with companies, and they go, "Well, we're interested in APIs, but we're trying. It's hard to get a project together to build our first APIs." And you have to say to them, "Actually, you know, projects are the problem. You know, projects are temporary and unique management structures." designed to carry out a once-off uh, and uh, temporary assignment, okay? So we're so used to them, we treat them as necessary evil and probably that there's no alternative. But APIs used internally and externally are moving us towards an era of reusability and modularity 
And what we're trying to move away from as much as possible is the use of projects for business development and innovation and partnering. So probably done crudely here, but you know, when dealing with, with some of the mature organizations that need to offer their data and their services and their brands into the growth of the API economy, you know, they talk about partnering as if incorporated joint ventures or strategic alliances will somehow be scalable and effective in the age of assistance. And I would argue they won't. Okay, they're too slow, they're not reusable, they're too rigid. A joint venture is too rigid, and a strategic alliance is too loose. Project-based inputs from two, like projects are hard enough to organize within one organization, never mind to organize them in two organizations, uh, and then produce a, a durable, effective outcomes for customers. So, I think it's a reasonable hypothesis is the way the age of assistance is emerging with partner brands working together in connected experiences that only API enabled partnering would be able to keep up. Okay, so, so we see some organizations that are very slow to scale and understand the API economy and they're talking about every API, we're looking at a few of them, but they all have to have use cases and they all have to have business cases, each and every one of them and we're going First of all, you need to think about API products from a methodology perspective, okay? The way services are going in all verticals, partnering is gonna mean API-enabled partnering, okay? So step back from the specifics of the first APIs you're gonna build and think about how you're going to do business in the future, okay? Which is a much more supportive and strategic framework for considering which APIs you might start with or which lines of business you might start with. So <clears throat> the hypothesis is, well, if financial brands just crack this API design and management stuff, they'll be able to handle the age of assistance. Um, obviously, any, any slide that begins like this, the answer is never right, it's always wrong. Um, so that's not correct. Um, it, it's not uh, technology, to echo Simon again, it's 20% it's the coding, it's 80% the people, it's as much, if not more, sociology than technology. Okay, so we all have a stake here today, even from a technical background, if we're gonna put our energies and our reputations into promoting the use of APIs, we all have to grapple with whatever label you put on this, um, co corporate culture, sociology, um, belief systems, okay? Um, so only because it's a catchy way to do it, uh, I would argue that it's as much about belief systems as uh, computer systems, okay? So what are belief systems? Um, they're all over, they're all around us. The biggest risk about dealing with belief systems is that they're so ingrained we don't think about them. But what are belief systems? They're systems, okay? So religions are belief systems, okay? And they, 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 they're all of the elements are interconnected. Uh, so you can't simultaneously believe in one God and many gods, okay? So they are systems in their own right and, and they underpin and we like to think as business people and as engineers that we make very, very objective clinical decisions based on the most clinical cold-hearted analysis, but actually every day businesses and customers are, are making, their decisions are heavily influenced by faith. Their faith that this is the right way to do things. Their faith that a certain brand will look after them. So we ignore it at our peril. There's belief systems all around us and humans have thousands of beliefs. Okay, so this isn't based on textbook stuff because I've, I've worked um, globally, uh, both in, in C-suite levels, often uh, in Asia and in Europe and the US, and you see common threads and factors all the time where belief systems inside many organizations that look increasingly out of date are harming their adoption of the API economy. Okay, so I'm gonna have a very crude attempt to try and unpack this and I think it's everyone's interest in the API community to think about this stuff. And we have to move beyond just saying, you know, corporate cultures aren't helpful in terms of, of building the API economy and building the AQ, API community. But actually we have to get much more specific about how has it been and how should it been? And not just say all the soft factors and the human factors aren't helpful. You need to get far more prescriptive and specific about where they're not helpful and where they, they should change. So, um, Simon, is at, uh, Echo Simon again, he's talking about post-cryptography quantum computing, and I'm gonna talk about old stuff, just to, just to counteract that, um, because obviously the best way to build business strategy is to try and figure out what's gonna change and what's not gonna change. 
because business strategy is a combination of both. Okay, so bankers, uh, when they invented in branches as their main distribution systems, obviously they had specific programs to do this, but they also had a belief system that underpinned the decision that a big UK or French bank or German bank or Spanish bank or a US bank decided that it would be a good thing to open up 500 or 1,000 branches. And this was how they were going to distribute. So uh, unlike some banks that are trying to adopt APIs at the moment and they feel they need to do a use case or certainly a business case for every API, those banks didn't do 500 separate use cases and business cases for each individual branch. Okay, there was an underpinning of faith uh, below th that investment program. So I've had a, uh, I'd be, I'd be, I don't want to give away my age, but some of these concepts are familiar to me. Um, so, so why did they invent in bran branch networks? Well, they wanted branches that were in the wealthy suburbs to get deposits. So they could pay 3% for the deposits, and they wanted branches in growing towns so they could do mortgages at 6%. Okay, and the main driver of profitability was that net interest income. Once upon a time, the use called banking did 363 business, that you pay 3% for deposits, you lend at 6%, and you're on the golf course by three. Okay. <laughs> it's probably changed a fair bit at this stage. And also, in terms of business banking, you need to be proximate to the exporters near the, port, uh, near the importers near the ports and exporters near the factories. So there was an underlying faith that you built a network, and they refined it over time. Okay. They gave the branch managers autonomy to make decisions, in a paper-driven era, when most businesses were on the high street and not out in the suburbs, they opened from 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock. And bankers did ecosystems back then, okay, as they still do. The local branch manager would build links to insurance brokers and accountants and lawyers, okay, as sources of business and assessment of who had a good reputation in the town. Okay, so a whole belief system, and they used this branch network to help build a national brand, and there would be network effects, okay? Um, and then customers should make appointments if they want to talk, all entirely pre-digital digital and entirely paper-based. If you wanted to transact in your account, you came in and you filled in a form. So there was a belief system, okay? And they invested in waves, okay? So building that as their main distribution strategy, uh, they certainly weren't assembling the top brass to, they certainly considered the costs and benefits of branches in minute detail, but there wasn't a fresh business case for every single branch, okay? It was a network building distribution strategy process. So they put their branches where they thought it would help them build a brand and build a balance sheet. So they invested in waves, they extended their informal links into adjacent service providers, and there was network effects, okay? And proven and statistically shown where, you know, if you could build sufficient branches across a territory, that people driving through the towns could see that you were in most towns, not every town, that was psychologically a safer place to put your deposits because it was a projection of strength and size. Okay, so there's network effects and it's been measured historically that if you in a region, I'm using the UK because of where we are, but if you had 5% of the branches, you'd probably have 3% of the deposits in the territory. But if you had 15% of the branches, you'd have, you could have 22% of the deposits. So there was network effects. Okay, so none of this is new to bankers, and they invested at scale significantly, and they predicated their entire distribution strategy on being great branch managers. Okay. So they invested in waves. Okay, so we certainly see, uh, certainly from my vantage point, I see a split between financial service companies that are getting very thoughtful in the C-suite about the human factors and how they scale up their whole organization uh, to move into ecosystems, uh, marketing, branding, governance, risk management, uh, and considering a market entry phase, okay? Because it's a foreign market. So if you're a big UK bank and you decide for the first time you're going to expand into Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, you pick a team for the purpose and you give them 18 months to land in that country, learn the culture, set up the administration, identify the valuable segments, get the first initial list of clients, and figure out how pricing worked in that market. Okay, and it might be 18 months, two years before they, they were given performance objectives that looked like the home market. So it's a market entry phase because it was a strange and unfamiliar foreign market, and the C-suite would drive that out. Similarly with ecosystems, the culture, the administration, the segmentation, the economics are very different 
for organisations that have traditionally done all of, manufactured all of their own services and distributed them all themselves. Therefore, it is a foreign market. And the entry into that foreign market needs to be driven from the top. And it needs the type of objective setting and support that recognises that there's a learning curve when you're, you're becoming established in a new market. Okay. So, so for the purpose of trying to illustrate that, let's try and contrast financial brand A and financial brand B. It's like those ads for washing powder. Um, so, so brand A has bought themselves fantastic new computer systems for APIs, but they are retaining the old belief system. Okay, and, and re I regularly see evidence of that. Um, I, I, APIs, yeah, maybe, but my logo won't be on every screen. My brand will disappear. Um, so I wouldn't support the investment in any APIs until I know in advance exactly who's going to use it exactly for what, how much money they're going to make, and how much I'm going to get out of it. Okay? Wouldn't have been a good recipe for opening a branch network. And then the other where there's a recognition from the top of organizations that it's not about new computer systems, that's 20% of it, it's also new belief systems. Okay? What's actually changing in terms of market dynamics? Um, and how should we approach that in terms of how we think and behave inside the organization and how we see the market? So let's for fun um, belief system in financial brand A and financial brand B. You can tell I'm biased, so I put you know, the one I don't like in red and the one I like in green. Um, but but the, these are massive factors. These are massive factors. S so there's a huge change in focus uh, in thinking about the market about, well, our staff drive, drive innovation versus ecosystem partners drive innovation. People like to look, cre people like to look clever. Okay, and if you've spent 20 years in an organization that does its own distribution um, and doesn't allow third parties to drive innovation, it's your job to look clever and not provide key components for third parties to look clever. Okay. So in the context of that, come across that, uh, we see the sense that because we're doing everything ourselves, the only segments of the market that are economic are the mass market segments, whereas the whole joy of ecosystems and that long tail of opportunities is that two organizations working together very efficiently can surface and meet new needs that are not being met by anybody at the moment. So these ecosystems expand markets. It's not a zero-sum game. Okay. And it, in the future, financial competition will not be about my product is slightly better than yours. It will be about ecosystem experience driving the financial brands. And uh, one I would call out is that a, an existing belief system that Customers should use a bank or an insurance company's own digital interface because it's plastered with logos. They can't possibly mistake that it's us, okay? <laughs> Versus we can serve the digital interfaces or we should serve the digital interfaces that the customers prefer. So 50 years ago, some clever person identified the marketing mix of four Ps and then consultants made it into seven Ps to make more money. But there was four at the start and it was price, product, uh, place and promotion, okay? The place is changing from the digital interface that your organization prefers to the digital uh, interface that the customers <coughs> prefer. And if you change the P for place, every other P changes. Okay, in the context of the original four Ps of the marketing mix, your promotion changes. You're now promoting your API products to third parties. Your pricing changes. I'm now investing for the welfare and growth of my favorite ecosystems that I'm using to distribute. Not everything I do in relation to APIs and ecosystems has to have its own return on investment uh, and cost income ratio. Um, and then product. For a financial services company, you still have your traditional financial contracts, but APIs become products to be marketed, and developers become a community and a segment to be managed just like customers. So an absolutely fundamental change. And, and one way we detect where belief systems are slow to change is around branding. Okay, in a very superficial, consideration of, of branding and that, well, my logo won't be on every screen, that would be a disaster. A and I can't emphasize enough how, how strong this is. S so w I had one conversation with somebody in a key position and I said, listen, you know, uh, let's say you, you open up APIs and you develop a very successful third party community and all of a sudden you're involved in <coughs> 10 times as many customer journeys and from those 10 times as many customer journeys, you double your sales because you've got a much bigger selling surface. But in certain cases, when you, when you survey them, customers are confused. You know, they have to be explained to them that you contributed to this connected experience. 
how would you, you know, what would you say to the CEO? And they got very exercised around how we can plodge this analytics gap. When you went and explained the situation to the CEO, is our brand disappearing? And I said, what do you think the CEO would say? And they said, well, you'd be a bit upset about that. And I said, would you not think you'd say, sales have doubled, what type of champagne would you like? <laughs> okay. So in the context of this, this is about leverage, leveraging the opportunity, making sure your business doesn't disappear because you're connected to these connected experiences. And, you know, logo is only part of, it's only a signpost. There's many, many ways in which you can communicate your meaning to your brand audience. So you can tell I've recently read up on branding because I'm still at the definitional stage. Um, but let's talk about brand purpose and, and brand audience. And I suppose while Medi has us focusing on the, on the financial vertical uh, in our agenda, you know, I would argue that the, the brand purpose of financial brands hasn't changed for thousands of years uh, in terms of what they mean to people. And I don't see it changing anytime soon in any material way. It doesn't matter what technologies come along. Okay. And that, but I think that API economy and digital ecosystems means that for financial brands, the brand audience is expanding very significantly and expanding as a significant opportunity for growth. So a brand has a purpose, how it intends to change the world for the better. Okay, so what is the brand purpose of a great financial brand? Okay, so when you see a company that claims it's going to very crudely mind your money, you know, move your, move your money, and occasionally maybe lend you money, okay? You know, we can put lots of flowery language on the rest of it, but that's what people expect them to do. That's the meaning they ascribe to what they're doing. So in terms of a brand purpose, and the professionals when they're doing this, they delve into storytelling because there's plots that, we, that are all hardwired into our brains and there's archetypes in every story that are hardwired into our brains. And when they're writing brand purposes for banks or insurance companies, they, they use brand archetypes, brand archetypes like sage, uh, citizen, caregiver, and they try and express that in the context of um, what the brand is. So ultimately, brand purposes are effective when they focus on why a brand is in business, not what it does. Okay, so the API economy and how it does it. So, so the API economy is going to make some radical changes to how traditional financial brands and new financial brands uh, distribute services and how they do things, but why they exist uh, to serve people is not going to change. Okay. So in that context, when bankers were setting up branch networks for distribution in the 1960s, they might have turned around to their, you know, the message they were trying to, the meaning they were trying to achieve with their brand audience was, on a journey, we're, we're here for the long term, we're gonna help you prosper, we're gonna help you sleep at night, Technologies might change, um, but financial services is a, is a specific skill. We know you're not an expert. We're the experts. We, we'll look after your interests. We, we are objective and analytical because we have to be. We try and protect you from harm. We do protect you from harm. Sometimes that means uh, saying no to you sometimes. No, you can't have a beach house with, a, with a, a hot tub. Okay, you can't afford it. Okay, we're available where and when you need us. And back then, when they were using branches for distribution, they were on the high street. 10 to 3, when people were in town, was sufficient to be there when they were needed. Um, and they were connected to other related services. 50 years ago, banks did banking, insurance companies did, did insurance. Um, there was quite significant differentiation between different uh, licenses and activities. And it, it, I would argue that in, in 20 years time, when Medi has us here having technical workshops about implanting APIs in our brains, okay, financial brand purpose and financial brand personalities will almost certainly be the same. Okay, whatever way the technology is working, the financial brands crudely will be minding our money, moving our money, and occasionally, if we behave ourselves, lending us money. Okay, so arguably these, these financial brand purposes are thousands of years old. Traditionally, financial organizations have recycled excess capital from mature businesses and mature households to lend it on at a profit to, to immature businesses and immature households that need the capital. So in terms of the digital value chain and expressing it here with organizations who haven't yet embraced the API economy, we're moving from this brand audience 
this brand audience. Okay, third party developers are becoming part of the brand audience for major financial brands. Okay, because if, if, if financial brands want to honor their brand purpose to, to be available to customers where and when they need them, in the age of assistance, that implies that where and when the customers need them is that the digital interface is that the customers prefer. Okay, so if they're honored to honor their brand purpose as the technical and business architecture of services changes, they need to go to this expanded brand audience. Okay, so if you're a fintech and you're finding dealing with banks a bit frustrating and clunky and a bit conditional, it's because in probably in many cases they haven't yet fully identified you as, given what you do, you're just as important to them as their customers. Okay, and this is real, this is a real sociological issue. Um, so when you ask a, an incumbent financial brand executive, you know, it, what, how would you feel if you opened up a third party ecosystem and in very early days, uh, somebody uses some of your APIs and combines with something else and gets rich, way richer uh, than you would like and uh, with an idea that you could have had yourself and they go, that, well, that would be very bad. And you go, would you not realize that them getting rich is the best developer marketing you know, that's going to save you so much money over the next five or six years in terms of showing what a contribution your APIs can make to connected experiences. Okay, so it's an expanded brand audience. So all those messages of meaning and relevance and trust that, that financial brands are trying to communicate through their own brand apps of we're on a long-term long -term journey with you, we're trying to assist you, we're trying to help you prosper, you can sleep at night, we're the gatekeepers of financial knowledge, we're analytical, we protect you from harm, we're there when you need us. Those exact same messages or meanings that are being attempted to achieve apply with the new brand audience which are developers. So in the age of assistance, great financial brands will have the same belief system for customers and developers. So obviously high tech graphics to explain that. Um, but but you know, you, 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 there's some fantastic books written on how to curate and develop a great um, third party ecosystem. Um, but, but at its simplest, uh, how do financial brands treat their customers? Okay, well, within reason, you know, the, the addressable market is the planet. Okay, but they want as many, as, they want as many customers as possible at the entry level. Okay, the entry level is designed to get as many customers as possible. Okay, you want the input of your customers into your service design. You don't be doing a pretty lousy job of managing your business if you're not getting your customers input into your service design. Obviously, because not all customers are equal, you pay particular attention to the most valuable ones. Okay, and value can be direct profit contribution or value can be influence on other customers. Okay, you have suitable staff to serve them. Okay, you tend not to put the introverts into customer relationship management roles. Okay, so people need to have the technical skills and the temperament for, for facing off against customers. And you want your customers to be prosperous because their prosperity is, is your prosperity. You onboard them fast and easily. There's nothing as silly as spending money on marketing, attracting potential new customers and have them abandon the onboarding process. And you, you obviously work really hard to differentiate what you offer in, in the category. And, and you work hard to solve their problems. That, that's how people treat customers. Well, in great financial brands in the, in the age of assistance, we'll have to have, out of necessity, the same philosophy for developers. Y you will want as many as possible at the entry level. Okay, and we're seeing some of the traditional financial, financial brands, whether they're banks or insurance, getting very hung up on, yeah, I like the idea of what some developers could do, but I'm not sure if I want them all that's kind of a tricky brief to give to your developer relations program. Okay, you want as many as possible. All partners are useful. All partners help what you try to do. Okay, you definitely want their input into your service design. Okay, it could be quite uncomfortable for a while um, once op APIs are opened uh, to have, you know, financial or technical professionals on Twitter being rude about your architecture. Um, but that's a feedback loop and the way the age of assistance is emerging with these connected experiences where brands work together, financial brands that have never had a open innovation business models need to get through that pain. Okay. 
you, you need to pay attention to the most valuable developers. In one context, how much are they paying for the use of the APIs? And in another context, how much input are they making into the service design process? Um, and how influential are they in the attraction and retention and enthusiasm of other developers? Okay. You have to have suitable staff to, to serve them. And that's a big ask for many traditional financial brands because you know, API product managers aren't gonna fall from the sky. They're gonna go to an early stage of um, API product management teams, combinations of data scientists, marketing people, software engineers, um, but moving toward these job roles and they have to be both technically equipped and able to reach out to a community of, of, of third parties. You want your developers to be prosperous, you want them to onboard quickly and easily, just like your customers, and you'll differentiate what, what they offer and you'll solve their problems. And sometimes we get objections which are, yeah, yeah, but how, how do I decide sometimes whether my course of action, you know, it, it looks like it might favor my customers over my developers or my developers over my customers. How can I possibly reconcile that? And the answer is every day as things stand, without, without a developer community, you're making decisions that prefer some customers over other customers. These are the conflicts of deciding your priorities in business. So you just have a new set of conflicts to reconcile between I'm gonna prefer some developers over others, I'm gonna prefer some customers over others, and some actions I take are gonna prefer customers over developers or vice versa, okay? But without doing too much work to your brand purpose and what you do, you have a vastly expanded brand audience. These people are not on payroll, They'll give you a fabulous um, feedback loop in terms of your service design. And crucially, they're going to move your services to the digital interfaces that the customers prefer. And there's 10 times as many, if not 100 times as many of those interfaces that are relevant than the one you can engineer yourself. So it's all to the good, but this will scale when belief systems start to modernize uh, at the same pace as the computer systems are going to modernize in terms of dealing with APIs. So four conclusions before Mehdi throws something at me is it's the age of assistance, more going on than just banking, and you need API products, APIs as products. Um, financial brands will need to refine their computer systems and their belief systems, but they moved from branch distribution to proprietary apps. They can make the move in terms of what they believe and what they have faith in from proprietary apps to the digital ecosystem. Good news for financial branding, they're probably going to ret retain their traditional brand purpose, but they can substantially increase their brand audience and at a great financial brand that's going to make this transition the same belief system will have to apply for developers and customers developers are customers all of them are valuable and that should be the starting point for any attempt to enter digital ecosystems